So, and, and we'll go back through some of the things we talked about the other day a little bit as well. So, this is, um, does anybody know what this animal is called? The chimera, right. So, what's characteristic of the chimera? Right, yeah, exactly. And that's kind of, you know, that's kind of when, when you think about hyper IgM carriers, they're sort of chimeras, right? You've got, you've got T cells that are doing one thing and T cells that are doing another thing or maybe not doing another thing. Uh, and so I think of it uh, in a way you can kind of think of yourself as, as chimeras, I guess, so the carriers. You know, this is the slide I showed the other day. I just, we're going to go back to it. And we're gonna, I'm going to talk more about this lionization thing and sort of what we know about it and what's, sort of what's normal, what's not normal, what, you know, what can we gather. And, and I'm going to be, I'll be really upfront that we, we don't know very much about hyper IgM carriers. I'm going to show you the world's literature on it. Martin already highlighted a couple of the papers that I'm going to go through as well, but I'll, I'll, I'm going to highlight a different piece of them. And um, it's not very much. So I'll be really frank upfront. We don't know very much. Just a reminder again, what is lionization? Um, again, uh, uh, Martin mentioned it, that you, you know, again, you've got two X chromosomes and every cell only needs to use one of those. So we'll just normally randomly turn off one of the others. I'm going to show you in a minute um, how random that process is. Uh, and, and, and just it's not, not actually not specifically related to C4 ligand distribution. Just, just taking normal females and looking at how, how random is that lionization? I'll show you that data in a minute. And it's kind of surprising. I guess maybe kind of, maybe not surprising. I don't know. Anyway, we'll take a look at it. Again, remember that if you're 50%, you know, you've got sort of an even mix of the two sets of cells. You've got some cells, in this case, that express CD40 ligands, some that don't. Uh, but you can skew one way or the other so that maybe you have fewer cells that express CD40 ligand or more cells that express CD40 ligand. And that, as Martin pointed out, there, there may be cases where there are extreme skewing, and we'll talk a little bit about those. And remember that the way that we, we do, we're lucky from the standpoint of the CD40 ligand protein, because it's a protein that's actually made on the surface of cells, we can actually detect the protein, so it makes it easier to look at what is that ratio of skewing between the cells. And again, we do it by this flow cytometry test where we take the cells, either we don't stimulate them here in red, or we stimulate them here in blue. And what we're doing is we're just looking, um, using an antibody that detects CD40 ligand, we, we put that on the surface of the cells. And if, if the CD40 ligand protein is there, then the cells become bright and they shift over on this. So in a normal individual, again, unstimulated T cells, stimulated T cells, we see that um, they once they get stimulated, they express CD40 ligand and it shifts over. So this is a measure of how much it's expressed. And then in a patient who lacks C40 ligand, you don't see really any expression. The two peaks overlap. In fact, in this case, the simulated peak is lower than the unsimulated peak, which is you know not typical of what happens. But then, of course, in a, in a female carrier, or in this case, this was a patient who was who had uh, who had a bone marrow transplant and, and with a mixed chimera that way. Okay, so I wanted to just let's let's just look at what do we know about lionization. So this process of turning off one X chromosome or the other, and what's the, just in the general population, and I think this is one of the better papers on this, where they basically took a thousand, a thousand females, thousand and five to be precise, thousand and five females, and they said, we're just going to look at the use of their two X chromosomes, we're going to take their peripheral blood, and we're going to look at how much skewing is there to either the, the, chromosome that came from dad or the chromosome that came from mom, okay? And it turns out that, amazingly enough, for those of you who, who you know, know statistics and sort of the, the st statistical, you know, a curve with sort of two standard deviations, in, in fact, what's called a Gaussian distribution, if you look at those thousand and five in, uh, individuals, this is, these are individuals who are just, you know, they don't have particular seeds, these are just they're randomly chosen. They took several of them, actually, that were newborns. And so these were really taken from cord blood, from baby and female infants that were born. And so about half of the patients, so they had 590 newborn samples and 415 samples from adult females, just to see if there was any difference. And really, there wasn't. What it means is in the general population among females, you know, most people, you know, the majority of the majority of females are sort of somewhere in the middle. They've got this lionization that's around 50%. But there are some females 
who are out here. This is this is um, so here they're saying this is less than less than three percent on this side using one X chromosome, and over here this is about the same distance, you know, around three to five percent over here. So this is just the normal pattern. So this, even though this is considered to be a quote unquote random process, it's a statistically random process and it follows this Gaussian distribution. There's some interesting data which I actually did not include here, but from a recent study that was done at the NIH on carrier females for X-linked chronic granulomatous disease, which is a you know, a, you know, a different immunodeficiency. Um, and what they saw in that study was that in fact this process, you think that maybe once it's set in place, for a particular individual that maybe it doesn't change, that in fact it's set through life. And that's what we had traditionally thought. That was, however, interestingly, if you look at this study with chronic granulomatous disease, what they had done is they had studied patients, the same patient, but over the course of a number of years, they'd sort of studied in an excellent, chron in, in, in excellent chronic granulomatous disease, they also have a, a test that they can do uh, where they can look by the f by flow cytometry whether or not the patient whether or not the cells have our CGD cells or not so they it's an easy test that they can do and and um, so they in some patients they've done this repeatedly over years and it turns out that this percentage of lionization had changed actually surprisingly and in fact there was a trend toward uh, the that that as uh, as females age they tend to skew actually a little bit more uh, to being more lionized one way or the other uh, over time. So this process that we thought was sort of a kind of set in stone was a lifetime might actually change. And this brings up a point that I think um, Martin highlighted so well in his talk, which is that you know if you if you begin to develop symptoms and you're a carrier, and you said, well, I you know, I used to be 50-50, but might be that maybe you're not 50-50 anymore. And, and I, I, have, uh, I have two female carriers, of, again, of chronic granulomatous disease, different immunodeficiencies, who we had tested initially, and they were, you know, they had like 20% normal cells. And one of them was the grandmother of one of our patients. She, she's a known carrier. And she presented, we hadn't seen her for some time, and uh, she came back to clinic because two years earlier, she had developed recurrent pneumonias. And she'd actually ended up seeing um, an oncologist and all kinds of stuff. And it turned out when we repeated her lionization, she now had less than, she had around f only 5%. She was, so she was like 20% when we'd studied her in her 60s. She's now in her 70s. And she is now at like 5% normal cells, which for chronic granulomatous disease isn't enough to keep you well, actually. That's when you, you, you start getting infections. So one pearl to take away from this is that even though you may have had this testing done before and you were in what might be considered a safe zone um, in terms of lionization, if you do start to get infections and you start to run into problems like you heard about from, uh, from Martin, um, it's worthwhile to be evaluated and to potentially just re-look at this, actually. We don't, we don't know with CD40 ligand deficiency whether we would see this same change over time. Uh, it's one of the many things we don't know. Uh, and so um, uh, I think that that is, um, uh, so one, one thing that I would just highlight about this, and, and you know, again, people, you can, you know, any one of you who are carrier females, you could be here, or you could be out here at one extreme or the other. You know, one where on one extreme you have, you know, more of your cells that express CD40 ligand, or more of your cells that don't. And um, just randomly, you could be at one extreme or the other. So that, that's that's important to think about. Um, so what's the range of lionization in hyper IgM syndrome carriers? And I'm going to show you the biggest published study on this. Okay which is the, one of the studies that Martin highlighted, which is five patients. Five patients is the biggest published study on this. Uh, now, we've done more than that in our clinic, and I'm shameful to say that we haven't published that yet, or in our, in our lab. We've, we've probably done around, around 20 to 30 
female cures, and, and I and I actually didn't didn't realize that this was all there was till I started digging in for, for this talk. I, I thought that there had been more. This is um, this is sort of um, four, well, three of the patients. It's showing sort of and one of the patients who was sort of one of the carriers who was sort of right in the middle, and then the other two extremes that they found. So again, this is the flow cytometry test. A normal, uh, a normal uh, individual who, who does not have a mutation, and again, unstimulated cells, stimulated, you know, almost, you know, 93% of the cells express CD40, CD40 like that and shift over. So here's one of the carrier females, uh, again, 50%, okay, so right there in the middle, uh, but on one, on one end of the spectrum was, was the lowest that they had in this study, which was 32%, okay, here, and the highest, which was 73%. So among these five female carriers, it ranged from 32 to 73%. Nobody that was sort of extreme in this particular study, um, and, uh, and like I said, there was a recent study in the CGD carriers that suggested that this lionization may change over time. So this is, this is the largest published study on female carrier lionization in hyper IgM syndrome five patients, okay? so. This will, I'll, I'll talk about this again in a couple of minutes, okay. Um, and what we need to do about that. All right, so, so this is a, a one of the papers. So, so Martin also pointed out this paper. This was, so, so there, there are two patients, uh, to my knowledge, that have been reported to have sort of extreme lionization C40 ligand. There's this patient uh, that Martin pointed out from France. Um, this was a 12-year-old female. She had a brother who had SS hyper IgM syndrome. She had recurrent upper and lower respiratory tract infections. IgM was <coughs> slightly low. Uh, her IgG was sort of low normal, and she had low IgG. So she didn't actually, even though she had this profile of being extremely lionized, she didn't actually look much like a hyper IgM patient. Her IgM was actually low, uh, and her IgG was sort of low normal. So it didn't quite look like a classic hyper IgM patient, but. Because her brother was affected, they went ahead and they, they did the testing. And I'll just, I'll, I'm going to highlight this so that you can see it. So, so here's a normal control. And this isn't, isn't the best flow cytometry. But again, here's a normal control, unstimulated in the dotted line, stimulated to see most of the T cells, they express it. Here's her brother, OK? So her brother, you can't even see the dotted line because it's behind the solid line. Unstimulated and stimulated are just overlapping. And you see there's just, there's pretty much nothing out in here. However, for, the, for her, for the, the, this 12-year-old uh, girl, you see that unstimulated but, and then stimulated, there's just a little tail out here. Can you, can you guys see that? There's just this little tail out here. And that's the 5% of cells that she had, 5% of her T cells that express CD40 ligand. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that 5% is not enough. That's really what we can learn from this. So 5% is too low. So we've got at least that much. So it looked like from the last study that 32%, those were supposedly healthy female carriers, 32% may be enough. 5% is too low. So somewhere between 5 and 32% is the magic cutoff, presumably, of where there is enough. But we don't know what that is, right? So, so, this, is, so this is this one. This is a patient from Japan that was published in 2006. Uh, also uh, 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 um, had a this this patient actually had a big chunk a big a chunk of the chromosome of the X chromosome that had been sort of moved. It had, had moved to another area, and so it wasn't expressing CD40 ligand. This was a one-year-old female, uh, and she had also recurrent upper and lower respiratory tract infections. Poor responses to vaccines, uh, and then if you look at her uh, her immunoglobulins, she looks much more like a hyper IgM patient with really elevated IgM, okay, and low IgG. So uh, so this you know 1300 IgM. Here's the normal upper limit of normal for high, uh, IgM 106 for this age. Lower limit of normal for IgG is 530, and she's at 169. So this looks much more like a classic hyper IgM patient. Uh, she did. And, and again, she was younger when she presented. So when you look at this, and this one played out a little bit differently, so let me just walk you through this one. So, so here's, the, here's the control. Ignore this 
this, these panels, this is just to control to make sure that the T cells are actually getting stimulated like they should. And they all, they all look pretty much the same, which tells you that the T cells did in fact get stimulated. They look kind of, so here's the control again. Uh, they, they say only 50% only of the cells, the nerve case from the normal control, just based on the way they did the study, 50% express the protein. Uh, here's another, this is a different type of hyper IgM, not CD40 ligand deficiency. This is uh, t the AID deficiency, the second type of uh, hyper IgM2. And, and you know, they, they express normal CD40 ligand, so they, they do 51%, 50%. Here's the patient, and um, they say only 3% expression, and it's really, it's just, it's just this little sort of bump out in here that they counted as being 3% expression. So again, 3%, 5%. Not enough to keep you well. So again, that sets sort of the lower bar that we know is not enough. The, like I said, 32% is we think is maybe maybe enough. Um, so that's that. All right. So so what do we need to do, uh, and and how can we sort of think about tackling this and getting more answers for carriers? So one of them is. Um, that we need to find out what sorts of things ail CD40 ligand carriers. Um, and we've been talking to Akiva about trying to do a survey of carriers just to understand uh, what do carriers have? Are, is, you know, are, are carriers experiencing an increased rate of infections, autoimmunity or inflammatory disease? Um, liver disease would be very important, and malignancies, I think, would be sort of the, the minimal set of information that we would want to try and uh, learn from carriers of hyper IgM syndrome, whether they are experiencing these. And that, I think, again, we, the only way we're going to know is to ask, and, uh, and so we need to do this. This is a study that needs to be done. Um, the other thing that I think is important uh, is to look at a larger group of patients who, or, or I should say a larger group of carrier females to look at this lionization question and to hopefully, uh, ideally, the, the ideal thing would be able to, 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 would be able to be able to pair that with the, with the data that we get back from the survey. That would be the most powerful study to do would be to say, you know, here's the data we have on infections, malignancies, uh, those sorts of things. Now let's pair that with how much lionization there is in that particular individual. Um, and I, I don't know for sure whether we're going to be able to write the IRB in a way that will allow us to do this. We're, we're exploring that, so we may have to do two different, two different things. But I think that this is an important study that needs to be done. Some of this, I think, I think we can begin to maybe look at this by taking all of the labs who have looked at carrier females and trying to pool data. There aren't too many of us who have who've done a lot of carrier females, but between Convino's lab and, I don't know, do you guys do carrier females or do you mostly just focus on the patients with your flow? Yeah, well, so far we have uh, focused on the patients, but I was just thinking that uh, in order to have a significant number of uh, patients as a carrier, uh, it would be nice if we can run it in your national. Yes, I agree. Because uh, although there are many families here, uh, you may not still get enough no, I know. Uh, number. Yeah. Uh, and in, in addition to that, perhaps we can make uh, stratify uh, the participants. So we will do the uh, the expression, we will do the functional assay, the CD40, CD40 ligand match the lionization, and then we separate the phenotypes. So yeah. what kind of problems? Because our environment is a little bit a little different. different. Yeah. Everybody has DCG in life, yeah. uh, will have some kind of uh, tropical intervention. So we stratify the patients according to the geographical region. Yeah. It's the environment, so we consider the environment, uh, physiology, expression, lionization, type of mutations, we put everything together. Yeah, and then we give a, a, a good work to a person from statistics yeah, yeah. to analyze the data, and then we can pull something really significant and impactful. Yeah. And I think, you know, looking at that distribution, again, that was, it, again, I, I want to just go back to that, um, this. 
So this was 590 patients <coughs> gave them this distribution. This, this, again, these were not patients. These were no normal female infants. These were normal adults. And this was 415. I don't know that we're going to have those sorts of numbers to look at, but if we had 100 or you know 150, we probably would begin to get some idea. We, we should at least begin to find out what the limits are kind of out in here so that we could understand a little bit better about kind of what the what the extremes are and maybe that would then help us to understand perhaps kind of where we are. Perhaps we can come up with a very important observation. It's about the environmental pressure under the myelinization thing. Mm -hmm. Because uh, we already learned that myelinization may vary uh, uh, in the same individual. Yeah. But I think we never correlated that with any kind of environmental pressure. Right. So uh, I don't know if by demand a person that will have infection suddenly somehow the body will uh, respond to rearrange this kind yeah. of uh, chromosome activation or inactivation. So I think it's worth that we can put all of the variables on the table, have a very good statistician, and analyze everything. Yeah. Yeah, and, it's, and again, it's something that you know we'd have to partner on as a foundation or a group, and, and you know, to, to try and do this. So, Amanda. CGD, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah. Do you think it's possible there's a correlation? Because they said, one of them said it was after menopause, that it could mm. be safe not to get your kids first appeared. Mm -hmm. Another woman said it was after her second pregnancy. Mm -hmm. there's, there's these links, these specific periods, puberty, pregnancy, menopause, yeah. where the hormones are changing, the woman's body changes. Do you think that that can have any sort of impact on the amount of expression? Yeah, I do. I do. Uh, I think, and you know, the the um, th there. So there, there was a trend. There was a trend. So that they didn't look specifically at pregnancy and things like that. In the, it, for instance, in that in that excellent CGD paper for the carriers, they they did look by age, and there did seem to be there was a trend to towards towards the lionization getting more skewed with age in that. But there's a, a, it was interesting as I was digging through the literature, just the general lionization literature, there, uh, there are some other papers that suggest even in the, even in the general population of, of women who don't have any particular disease, that there tends to be a trend towards more skewing as patients get older. And, and if you're already skewed in the direction where you don't have very much you know, maybe you maybe you only have twenty percent of your cells that express CD40 ligand, um, and now, you know, you as you age and maybe whether it's menopause or having had pregnancies, I, I I think all of those things could certainly contribute. Now that skewing becomes progressively worse, then you could very easily find yourself in in a situation where you're below sort of the magic number which we don't even know what the magic number is like I said we we've got a you know we've got the range between 5 and 32 that's our number right it's it's somewhere in there <laughs> we just, so we need to narrow that down um, and I think you know and, and I think the other thing um, to point out and I'm so glad that Martin brought it up which is this you know, the fact that um, there is certainly other genetic variability that may impact, um, you know, it may be that you're, you, you know, if you've only got half as many, half of, half of your cells that express CD40 ligand and maybe you have a second uh, gene variant uh, that, that affects immune cell function, you pair those two together and now you begin to have problems, I think. Um, um, as Martin uh, pointed out, I'm, I'm glad he, he pointed out that paper. It's, it, it, there's there's more papers actually that, you know, it, it, it's funny. We in, in medical school, I, I still remember sitting in, you know, sitting in medical school. The the old timey medical school professors, uh, I, I remember sitting and getting grilled uh, by by you know this sort of very esteemed uh, you know physician. You know, you, you can't 
there, they, there can't be two diagnoses. There has to be one unifying diagnosis, you know. And I just, I just really want to go back and, and find that person and take that paper back and say, uh, you know, it turns out 5% of people actually have two genetic diagnoses. Not just two diagnoses, but two genetic diagnoses. And their disease is some mishmash of those two. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily one or the other, it's some weird mishmash of the two. And, and um, so they've got their own disease, which comes from having two genetic defects. 5%. That's not, I mean, that is a significant enough number of patients that, you know, you, you, it says we need to go looking, as, as Martin has so nicely pointed out. So, so anyway, I, um, those, those things are harder to sort out, you know, those interactions between different, different genes. Sometimes it's, you know, the, the easy ones sort of fall out and we find them, but I, I, my guess is there's a lot more of that than we probably appreciate at this point that, will, that may fall out later. Um, so, uh, and, and that's a much bigger and much more expensive study to do than the, the first two that we talked about. Um, but, but anyway, I think, um, you know, you've now, you've now seen the world literature on hyper IgM carrier females, okay? So, you know as much as I do at this point. And uh, so, uh, it, and it's really quite sad that we don't know more. I will just say we we uh, we need to we need to know more. So so anyway, hopefully the the hope would be that we can partner together and and try and uh, try and find out more. So that you know hopefully by the time we you know meet again in two years, we'll have a better more definitive things to say. So yes, from us, uh, our first report to this uh, certified study from the United States, now for Oh, great. Perhaps we can reach almost 60 new sites. Yeah. That's a lot of new sites. Yeah. So we can contribute potentially to that number. Yeah, it'd be amazing. It'd be amazing. It'd be great to do it. And especially since you guys run the assay the same way that we do. I mean, it's a. Yeah, so you know, the CD40 and CD40 diagnosis, I'm going to say it's just popular. The rest because of the new rest from you and the new. What we have to do is the prioritization uh, uh, that we have to make it a standard in the same way to match the data. Yeah. Yeah. So the same for So that's all I had. So happy to take questions. If you've got any questions, I don't know that I'm going to have answers, frankly, um, for you at this point, but I'm happy to. Happy to chat and you know open it up for discussion. And would look for other suggestions or if there's things that we're you know that that we haven't brought up or thought about um, uh, that we need to that we need to think about. I think um, you know again this is this needs to be a, um, a, a, a something that we that we work on together because it's the, really the only way we're going to get the numbers that we need to be able to, to do this. So anyway, anything else? Anything else? Akiva, anything from a foundation standpoint? Or? I mean, we've been discussing Martin's doing the survey and then continuing on to the yeah. stage. So, I mean, we'll start working on that and hopefully we'll get as many as we can. I mean, I know people about it. I know we're talking about like 100 carriers, but you know, <coughs> I'm like, I was going to say, you can probably tally up 100 in your mind at this moment, right? Yeah. I know that there's a handful, I know a lot of carriers within the foundation, and they're not all, you know, that's the thing, if we can get it written up international, yeah. it that's great, our because we've got a lot, yeah. new family's got a whole handful of carriers as well, we've got a couple families. Yeah, yeah. 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 so we can start piecing up, <laughs> yeah. but I mean, when you start piecing five here, and we've got 13, 14 still living here, yeah. we've got, you know, we can probably get that hundred, yeah. over hundred carriers that can. Well, and if Canino, if they've identified 50 in the Latin, 50 families in the Latin American database, you know, I mean, yeah. one, there's one, probably one carrier in each of those families, probably right. more I mean, than that. So. These days, we had like 220 families in our group 
groups that we know of, yeah. so, you know, now that's just the high grade of GM, that's not excellent. Of course. So when we yeah. narrow that back down, let's just say excellent, there's quite a few. Yeah. So I think we there need to. There, there would be some kind of uh, interrelation because uh, there are some families that come from other countries. Okay? Yeah. So what I can assure you is the Brazilian chapter, then uh, that one will be like uh, over 25 families in the whole Brazil. Now, starting with the Brazilian chapter, perhaps again. Yeah. Sure, because there will be some people that will. Not yeah, of course, yeah. Let's say we can show up with uh, 15, 20, that should be already a good summer. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right, thanks guys, appreciate it. <laughs>